And then, finally, there is a third group that emerges onto the stage of politics here. Remember, there was African Americans, there's women, and now there is poorer whites, yeoman farmers, poor whites. Now, of course, they had had the right to vote before the Civil War. They had voted. But they hadn't, except in a few places, been mobilized politically in their own self-interest. Um, now, in some areas, they are. Unfortunately, I don't have a map up here, but just imagine the South, if you can. I'm talking about places like Eastern Tennessee, Western North Carolina, the Appalachian mountain chain that goes right down the heart of the South from Western North Carolina into Northern Alabama, into parts of Mississippi. Then you have the Ozark Mountains in Arkansas, um, some of the Piney Woods. In other words, the backwoods, the non-plantation areas with yeoman farmers, poor white farmers. Many of them don't own any slaves. Many of these areas have very little slavery. Western Virginia is the best example. That actually secedes from Virginia. None of these other areas can secede, but they all harbor considerable opposition to the war. There is a war within the war in the South, an inner civil war, as well as the, war, the civil war between Union and Confederacy. This is a fundamental problem for the Confederacy. There is dissent both North and South. There is opposition both North and South. But there is nobody in the North who wants the South to win. Very, very few. Even the Democrats, the so-called Copperheads, we'll talk about that next time, they oppose the Lincoln administration, but they do not support the dissolution of the Union. They think different policies can bring the South back. The South has a large number of people who want the other side to win. Start with the slaves, three million of them or so in the Confederacy, and now increasing numbers of these poorer white farmers uh, who find that the war is being conducted in a way they cannot, uh, they cannot support. Um, people of this area had little in common with other parts of, you know, with the plantation belt of the Confederacy. In the war, they start coming into their own, as I say, politically. Um, so again, my syllogism. Remember, slavery is the cornerstone. The war sparks the disintegration of slavery. That leads to efforts to bolster slavery, and those policies divide white society. The 20 Negro law, the, the way taxation operates, Things like that convince people that the war is not for Southern independence, it is for slavery. A slaveholding lawyer in Northern Alabama in 1862 wrote this in his diary, a very interesting comment, Joshua Moore. The object of the war, says Mr. Lincoln, is the restoration of the Union as it was. He may think so, and doubtless does. But from the very nature of the conflict, so sure as the war continues, it is the death blow to slavery. There are but a little, some or a little, over 300,000 men taking all the slave states that are interested in it, interested here in an economic sense. In other words, there are 300,000 owners of slaves. That's families, owners of slaves. Men who have no interest in it are not going to fight through a long war to save it. Never. They will tire of it and quit. Now, not everybody does that. The, the, the upcountry is deeply divided in the war. As I said, the large majority of soldiers in the Confederate Army are non-slaveholding white farmers. Most of the officer corps are slave owners, big slave owners, but not the ordinary soldier. But by the same token, the large majority almost by definition, of those who desert from the army are also non-slaveholding white farmers or those who uh, 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 evade the draft and try never to go into the army in the first place. Um, parts of the upcountry become centers of organized resistance to the Confederacy. Um, I hate to mention Hollywood movies, but have you ever saw the movie Cold Mountain, which is actually based on a novel, a pretty good novel, you see something, this is Western North Carolina. You see the internal debate within the, or not violence, the internal fight within the, some parts of the Confederacy between the pro-Union and the pro-Confederate uh, people. As the financial situation deteriorates, this grows more to be more and more of a problem. 
In that at Western North Carolina, a group is created called the Heroes of America. What does the Heroes of America do? They run deserters off to the north, up the Appalachian mountain chain. They hide people who are drafted and don't want to go into the army. In other words, they are actually conducting virtually military operations against the Confederacy from within. And the same kind of thing happens in some parts of Alabama, Mississippi, uh, Arkansas, etc. Um, bands of deserters by 1863 are pillaging farms in some of these areas. Um, the phrase, which you hear both north and south, it's a rich man's war and a poor man's fight. In other words, the way the Confederacy conducts the war to defend slavery and to give exemptions to the upper class creates more and more class resentment among the mass of white, of white Southerners. Well over 100,000 men desert from the Confederate Army during the war. Now, a lot of people desert from the Union Army also, but the Union Army, the Union has much more population. Some number, it's a little unclear, maybe about 50,000 white men from the South serve in the Union Army, plus 200,000 black men. In other words, a quarter of a million Southerners are serving in the Union Army, black and white. There's nothing like that from the North. Um, so this internal problem, this internal dissent is a debilitating thing as time goes on in the, in the Confederacy. The lines of division, the, the, the Civil War, to throw out a metaphor, is like an earthquake in the South. After an earthquake, you see faults, right? You see lines of division. You didn't even, unless you're from California, you didn't even know they existed before the war. But there they are. The, the earthquake shows you those cracks in the society which hadn't been really visible before uh, the war takes place. War requires sacrifice, by definition, right? Every war requires public sacrifice. It requires money, it requires death, it requires mobilization, it requires many people doing things they don't normally do and they don't want to do. But for broad public support, broad public support requires that people believe that sacrifice is being equally shared, right? That everybody is sacrificing that not, some people are not being exempted from the sacrifices that are required. And many non-slave owners increasingly feel this is not the case, that the way the war is being conducted is not fair, um, particularly these yeomen whose home food production is disintegrating because of the war itself, because of the tax in kind, because of impressment. Um, and the growing perception that the planters are not sharing their fair share of the burden of the war. The 20 Negro law, the ability to buy yourself out of the draft or provide a substitute, uh, all those things feed this growing sense of discontent among white Southerners. It's unorganized, there's no political party mobilized in that sense. It's much more sporadic, it's much more localized. You do have some governors like Brown or Zebulon Vance of um, North Carolina who begin to talk about maybe we should negotiate for peace, maybe the war should be ended in some way. But in other words, this internal problems of the Confederacy, I think, are much more serious than the internal problems that the Union faces. So that's why I say blaming poor political leadership may not be our full answer because the political leadership of the South faced a far more dire situation. Not even, I'm not talking about the battlefield, politically, within their own society, than the North did. So just bear this in mind as we go along because once Reconstruction comes, these disaffected white Southerners will become a major political battleground. Can they be brought over to make an alliance with blacks after the war? Can the two groups that oppose the Confederacy in one way or another actually join forces in Reconstruction or will white supremacy, loyalty, etc., pull them back into an alliance with the planter? And a lot of the politics of Reconstruction will revolve around that question. So let's finish for today, but next time we will look at the North, the internal history of the Union 
and some of the effects of the war there.